Right. Uh, you know, Amanda, there's little introduction about you. Um, so a little bit, uh, I know that Amanda has previously given a talk to the Lewis Carroll Society um, about Yayoi Kusama. And this is a slightly different talk um, in that it's about not just Japan and Yayoi Kusama, but a broader Asian culture's view of Alice. So, I mean, some of the things I know they did, because I, I went to the manga exhibition as well. Um, and I and actually I saw that you've already guest edited the third issue of the journal adaptation as well. So if I just kick off, so what, um, what is the, I mean, obviously I know that you're a, a professor in, um, in Asian cultures and what's your interest in Alice and in Asian culture? So I'm particularly interested in how today's media systems work, how stories move across media, you know, why do we have 5,000 Marvel superhero movies and what are we not getting in exchange for that, that kind of thing, which is really, um, if you want to study how media relate today, the Japanese media environment is perfect. A lot of things that are going on in the rest of the world today, uh, in terms of media, happen there earlier and to a greater extent. So as I was looking into that, um, I suddenly, I, I thought I would do a, a case study of Alice, and I thought it would be a chapter, maybe. Um, there was far too much material for one chapter. <laughs> So now it, it's it's a, going to be a book and um, there have been some pieces already published in different areas and more will come. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the Asian culture's adoption, I think this is your first slide. I'll just uh, mm -hmm. So give me a shout when you want me to move on to the next. Okay. Um, so this is an image of uh, Youth World or Shonen Sekai. Um, this is the magazine that published the initial Japanese translation of an Alice novel. And this particular copy of it is now housed in the uh, Cassidy Lewis Carroll collection at the University of Southern California. Um, so this is, I thought this would be a good way to start off the talk because it's, it's the first that we know of, the first appearance of Alice in any particular uh, form in Japan. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's not being published as Alice in and of itself. It's being published as part of a uh, children's magazine that has a variety of materials. Um, and if, uh, Stephen, if you would go to the next slide. Uh, when we get there, you will see that um, something that may look a little familiar about it, right? We may, we, we may <laughs> recognize these images just a bit. Um, so at this point in Japanese history, there was a lot of uh, foreign material being uh, translated and published in Japanese journals for all ages. Um, for some reason, this particular translation is actually through the looking glass. It's translated as Kagami Sekai or Mirror World. And I, I don't know that anyone knows why they started with uh, Looking Glass rather than uh, Alice's Adventures. But I think it, it kind of um, explains or, or symbolizes in effect the cultural turmoil going on in Japan at this period. You may have heard that Japan, um, they didn't allow a lot of foreign cultural or scientific materials into the nation for a long time. And that ended abruptly in the middle of the 1600s, roughly. Um, so in the 1890s, when this public, the, this translation comes out, suddenly just all at once, it's like a, a tidal wave of material is coming. And it's not, you know, tidal waves aren't known for their organization. So sure, why not translate Looking Glass before Alice's Adventures? 
Um, and are people really going and saying uh, to the uh, original authors, could, could we pay you a bit to translate this and publish it? No, they're not. They're definitely not. So um, when they published this, they got uh, someone to just sort of draw over Tenniel's drawings and include them in the text as well. Um, and Stephen, if you have a question about any of this, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, so the f would they have um, avoided the first one? Because I think, you know, the first one is about challenging the status quo. Was there any cultural piece about that where the other one is more about progressing up the hierarchy? So in a weird way, um, both, trend, both books uh, actually challenge the status quo. At this point in Japanese uh, history or culture, Japanese girls aren't really supposed to travel outside of the house on their own. Um, they aren't supposed to talk back to authority figures or adults. Alice does these things. So she is uh, very much a um, model of modern European femininity. And on top of that, I mean, it's just so strange to do Looking Glass because it's based on a chess game. Japanese yeah. children had no idea what chess was. <laughs> and in fact, if you read it, I mean, I find it hilarious. It's great because when you get to the point where you really need to understand that Alice is shifting from pawn to queen, the translator, he just sort of says, oh, a traditional Japanese demon has popped up and Alice runs away from it. And then suddenly um, she wakes up on the lawn with her sister again. <laughs> Do they have them so, sort uh, of the, but they have lots of transformation myths, don't they, in um, mm -hmm. in Japan as well? So it wouldn't have been quite as big a uh, difficulty for them to get over it. Right, it fits in with Japanese culture in many ways. Um, there is definitely an openness to, uh, well, like I said, a traditional Japanese demon popping up. Um, that's actually kind of common in Japanese uh, stories before that point. So in a weird way, the translator, and his name is um, Hasegawa Tenke, in a weird way, Hasegawa made it very Japanese at the end, <laughs> um, in a way that the readers, the very young readers or the, the parents reading to their children, they would have understood that. Um, it would have fit in for them in a way. Okay. Um, if there are any questions, if people put them into the chat box, we'll, we can go through them, you know, at the end. Um, so if you would... Uh... Yeah, go to the next. Oh, so um, I can answer this one quickly, actually. They did translate chess to shogi, um, which is a, a Japanese game, but there isn't really a comparable uh, change from pawn to queen. Um, so it didn't quite work the same. Um, and that's why, you know, it, it works for a bit, and then they're just sort of like, demon time. <laughs> um, it is very fun to read, honestly. Um, but it, it's not, it, it's also emblematic of the, the difficulties when you can't, uh, when you have readers who, you know, literally Alice's clothing, um, sandwiches, things like that, all of that is new, I, all of those are new ideas to Japanese people and in particular Japanese children at the time. And in fact, uh, Stephen, if you'll go to the next uh, slide, um, I just wanted to give you an example. This is the same uh, uh, magazine issue, and you'll see that they're introducing um, new ideas. They're introducing what warships look like. They are also introducing um, two gentlemen who, you know, they're appearing in full-on regalia, but they're being introduced as hakase, or uh, doctors. Not necessarily medical doctors, but the, the doctorate holding uh, type. So this, is, this magazine is a mix of informative and fun. And it, I mean, like I said, the, the Mirror World translation, it's very fun. You definitely get that. And that's something that sets this magazine aside or apart from earlier children's magazines. It's not a, it's not like they have a huge tradition in Japanese history, but there were a few more that popped up before uh, Youth World. And many of them are very didactic. They're kind of boring, not to be mean. Um, so 
when Youth World comes along, they do try to be interesting. So Mirror World does introduce new ideas in part through uh, images like these, in part through uh, sometimes articles, but also by having translated works like Looking Glass uh, that allow them to introduce, you know, what is a sandwich, but in a way that's much more interesting. So there's, there's sort of two elements, there's a story element, then actually the other interest is the cultural, you know, strangeness of it as well. Mm -hmm. And that marks many early translations of Alice into Japanese, this idea that, you know, it's, it's educational. And in point of fact, there are, for a reason I still don't quite understand, but there are a lot of uh, English language learning textbooks that are um, that use Alice in Wonderland either in part or in whole. There was one from I think as early as 1921 where it's a, a two-page spread with the Japanese translation on one side and the English text on the other for people for adult language learners. So they're learning wonderful words that don't actually exist in English um, but again it's more fun right? Yeah and, and that still happens today German mm -hmm. <laughs> versions as well. Mm. Yes. I've often found amateur Japanese translations of Alice online where people who have a little bit of um, English classes they want to do their own translation of Alice for fun and they get pretty interesting. Um, and maybe that's a, a good point to, to jump to uh, the next slide. Um, for a while the only um, versions of Alice that I have found in Japan are textual. Um, but then when you get to today, suddenly we have everything. Um, so the left-hand image is an advertisement for a clothing company called Putumayo. And their designer loves Alice. So every collection includes a few Alice items. Sometimes it, they're almost solely Alice items and they look very lovely. Um, so we have definitely Alice clothing. There's a, a genre of clothing called Lolita and that has in fact been described as inspired partially or half by Alice in Wonderland. Um, the other half being by Rococo culture, a French Rococo culture. Then we have a number of Japanese comics or manga, including uh, Are You Alice, which I have volume one of on the screen on the top right here. And Alice in this case, if you can tell from the, the coloring of him, there, there's a question as to whether the young gentleman in the white suit is in fact Alice in this uh, series. And you'll get even um, references to Alice in things that aren't necessarily 100% about Alice. So the bottom image is from the end credits of an anime or Japanese animation called Dance with Devil. Um, and for no particular reason, in the end credits, they dress the protagonist up as Alice. Um, so these are just sort of showing the variety of forms that Alice now takes today in popular culture. Um, and I have some uh, examples from the fine arts, but Stephen, did you have any questions about any of these? Uh, no, I mean, I've come across not these in particular, but I've seen... Um... Alice in the Land of Hearts. Alice, you know, there's, um, there's, if you're in, there's lots of manga comics, and the mm -hmm. styles of them are very different. I mean, I like the, um, particularly the Alice in the Land of ones, because mm -hmm. they're like a cross between Alice in Wonderland, um, a caper movie, like an old Ealing comedy, with a bit of Quentin Tarantino thrown in as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Alice in the Land of Hearts is based on the video game series, right? Yeah. Um, and those are particularly interesting from a production point of view because the game company that created that game, the initial Alice in the Country of Hearts game, um, that company's really sort of came to success and prominence and financial viability through that game. So they made several spin-offs. Um, they've also got, uh, was it Alice in the Country of Diamond, Alice in the Country of Clover. They yeah, did and make... Each, and mm -hmm. each of them have got a number of books as well. There's, you know, mm -hmm. it's, a re it's, it's quite incredible when you, you see it. Mm. And the number, the books that they have, the manga that they have, are often um, 
created by different people. They've even published, although I don't think they've been translated into Japanese or into English, sorry. Um, they've even published a number of uh, collected volumes where each chapter is set in the world of the games, but it's a, a one-shot story. It's complete in that chapter, and it's by a different person. Um, and they've got a whole series of these, which just goes to show how wildly popular this material is, but also how welcoming the creators are to other people getting involved and sort of playing in their sandbox. Yeah, there's a whole theme, I mean, not even just in Asia, of, um, I think what you would call it, um, remediation, where the story is taken, and I know it's a theme of the talk, but it happens with film, with animation, theatre. Mm -hmm. And that, that's sort of where, theoretically at least, my work is uh, aimed at. Um, for example, if you look at the three examples on the screen right now, None of these are created by the same people. I've never come across any suggestion that any of the people involved in creating these even know each other. So they're all working in these same ideas and they're all creating unique materials. But then you get spin-offs of these things that then have sort of take on a, a life of their own in turn. And so the material spreads and we all recognize it as being Alice. But how does that really function on a day-to-day -day basis in today's world? Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, um, you'll see some things that look a little less obviously Alice-like. Um, so the left-hand image is from Carol Modernology, um, which is also in the, actually I think all three of these are in the holdings of the Cassidy Lewis Carroll collection, if anybody would, uh, is ever there to um, see them. Um, but Carol Modern Modernology was an exhibit of Alice-inspired uh, art or Alice uh, adapt adaptations into fine art. Um, so each piece within the exhibit gets its own image, um, and the images are yay big. Um, so they were put together not into a bound book, but in uh, a set of separate cards so that they can continue to circulate as fine art in their own right. And everyone did something very different. Um, so not everyone created their own Alice dolls, but this one I thought has a bit of character to her and a funny expression. In contrast, uh, the top right is an image from an art book called Yamigari Aris, Alice, sorry, Yamigari Aris, um, which is uh, Alice the Shadow Hunter. And uh, these images, this is a book, you can see a bit of the text at the very bottom, but the, it's more important really for the images and the manipulations that the creator has done. And to give a, a third very different example, um, this is music called Kito Watashiwa, or um, I definitely, and then it's sort of, you can see it sort of goes dot, dot, dot at the end. Um, this is from a book by the modernist playwright Betshaku Minoru. Um, Betshaku Minoru is one of the most prominent modernist playwrights coming out of Japan, and he wrote two separate books of plays of, that are themed on Alice. And in one of them, uh, the one that this image comes from, he even created music to go along with his plays. So you can see artists they really push themselves in different directions. We think of Betshaku as being a th uh, playwright, but in fact, he's also a composer. And it's, it's Alice that kind of allows him to push in that direction uh, and do so rather fruitfully, in my opinion. Yeah, the one in the top right-hand corner looks like a scene from um, The Grudge. That one, it is, when I first saw that book, I was a bit taken aback because it is kind of scary if you look at the other images. But at the same time, there's something that draws you in, like the way in this image, her eyes, you can see there's something in them and it makes you want to sort of look closer and closer until you figure out what it is. I think you're right that it's also a bit like um, the Jan Svankmeyer um, mm -hmm. usage of Alice as well, which was very you know, very dark, um, hardly any words, I think, and um, just, mu you know, music to tell a story. Mm. 
And I think that's one of the keys to Alice's success. You can take the story in so many different directions. You can go dark, you can go light, you can go into um, sort of, shall we say, specific directions. There's an example at the very end of this uh, presentation where a Taiwanese TV drama uh, show uh, used Alice as a uh, sort of key to examine what it's like to be a violinist in contemporary Taiwan. There's nothing about Taiwan, there's nothing much about, you know, how to be a violinist in Alice, but they found a way through Alice to ex explore that territory, which is fascinating. Um, what's the next? Yes. Speaking of exploring territory, uh, the next slide is a quartet of places that I was able to visit with the guidance of um, members of the Lewis Carroll Society of Japan, uh, who were very kind to me uh, when I've been there. So you can see on the, on the left, you get two different um, restaurants, two different Alice-themed cafes. Um, and I feel the need to point that out because you can kind of see on the bottom one, uh, the restaurant had very uh, dark decorations and yet the top restaurant had very light uh, sort of afternoon cakes and tea type atmosphere. And if you can't tell in that lower image on the left, there's a little cookie that has been cut in the shape of Alice uh, decorating the dessert there. The top right is actually an Alice themed store called Alice on Wednesdays or Suiyobi no Adis. They only sell Alice materials um, and it's, it's uh, a, this is only one level of a st store that I believe had something like four to seven floors. So they have a wide variety of materials um, in a pretty much every format you can think of up to and including flavored popcorn, which is very tasty. And then you can, uh, if you want something um, of your own design, the bottom right corner came from just an everyday uh, department store called Tokyo Hands. Um, and that's just fabric that you can buy and make your own material out of. So I like putting these three together because they, they kind of show how you can do Alice in your own way in Japan. If your version of Alice is very, interest, uh, very themed on tea, for example, you can go out and have tea with your friends in an Alice themed cafe. If your idea of Alice is a little more decorative, maybe you want your, your own Alice hair tie or something like that that you buy at Alice on Wednesdays. Um, the uh, darker uh, restaurant, that is a wonderful place to say have maybe a, a romantic dinner out with your spouse. Or maybe you are sort of more prosaic and you want to decorate your apartment so that you can see a bit of Alice every day in which case maybe you make a, a table skirt or something or a throw pillow out of Alice fabric. You can modify it to match your lifestyle in a variety of ways in Japan. Um, and I think that's worth pointing out because there's this flexibility on the part of both artists and consumers, right? We talked a little bit about how Artists can take Alice in all sorts of directions. They can explore all sorts of different themes and ideas, um, but then consumers as well. They, have a, they can exercise a degree of creativity and personalization, I guess, uh, just in terms of how they choose to integrate Alice into their lives. So it's really um, key to Alice's uh, pre uh, prevalence in Japan and also its enduring nature, the, its enduring popularity, that it is in fact very, very flexible and very malleable to people's interests. Yeah, I think uh, we had American Mickey a couple of months ago giving a talk about um, video games and he's based in Beijing rather than mm -hmm. Japan, but he was also saying how big the cosplay aspect mm -hmm. of it was as well. You know, oh, yes. the, the amount of effort, detail and time that goes into, I mean, if you look at the, the food on the bottom left or dressing up is just incredible. Oh yes, I think I, I saw that talk and I believe he was talking in particular about cosplay as characters from his games. Yeah. Um, 
there is also uh, a sort of culture of uh, what you might think of as uh, weekend cosplay, sort of. Um, I don't think it's done quite as much as it used to be. It was particularly popular about 10 years ago. Um, but, um, you know, most students in Japanese schools wear uniforms and their, their appearance is very strictly regulated at school. So the way they have uh, responded to that is by on the weekend dressing up, you know, just going full on unique in their styles. And that does mean or can mean um, quite a degree of uh, personal work in creating clothing to their taste. And that's where that Lolita style of clothing that I mentioned comes in, yeah. um, where people wear, can wear very frilly skirts. They can dress up, um, you know, where they can dress up using um, unusual hats. Um, and particularly, they can dress up as sort of the Mad Hatter or Alice. Um, but th there's a neighborhood in uh, Tokyo called Harajuku, where s young people used to just, on a Saturday morning, they would dress up in these very detailed outfits that must have taken, you know, dozens of hours to put together. And some of them, um, the pieces were bought and, you know, cost hundreds of dollars each. And yet they would, um, they would basically, as a hobby, or to express themselves, dress up and go to Harajuku and hang out with their friends for a few hours on a Saturday. Um, it was a very important outlet for those uh, young people. Um, so we have a, a slightly different example uh, in the, the next slide. Um, these are, so these two images are from a series of six commercials. Um, which I think you can guess it were from, uh, or were for Kit Kat. Um, Kit Kat hired a renowned director, Iwai Shunji, to direct these commercials, and they include the same two girls. These, uh, the series was called Hana to Aris, or Hana and Alice. And you, you don't exactly get the direct sense initially when you watch the first commercial that this is uh, Carol's Alice, but in fact it is. Um, there, the series was set in a contemporary Japanese high school, and it, um, you know, it, it was a solidly successful set of commercials. But here's the thing: if you hire a renowned director to do a series of six commercials, he's going to get a bit invested in the project. Uh, in the project. And he really liked this idea of Carol's Alice, uh, whom he created as a ballerina uh, in contemporary Japan, with her friend Hana. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that EY uh, retained the two actresses uh, to create a film called Hana to Aris, or Hana and Alice. And this is, um, there's a poster advertising it on the left here. Um, and you can kind of get the sense that one of them is in an upside down world compared to the other. But you also get the sense that you're not sure which one is which. Um, and then this wasn't enough for, for EY. So he actually created his first ever animated film, Hana to Aris Satsujin Jiken. And uh, its official translation is The Case of Hannah and Alice. But I don't think that's a great translation because it's specifically the murder case of Hannah and Alice, um, which gives a, a significantly darker vibe, title-wise, I think. Um, and it's quite funny, you can see from the colors, it doesn't seem like it's very dark, but it is a rousing sort of adventure. It's how Hannah and Alice meet, and to put it simply, they meet because they think somebody may have been murdered, and they're going to investigate. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I ought to spoil for anybody. <laughs> it is quite fun. Um, and it's, uh, it's a prequel, in a sense, to the live action film. Um, but even that wasn't enough for EY. So he, um, not directly, he hired an artist, um, but to create that same uh, story, the case of Hannah and Alice, as a manga. And this is. Uh, getting into part of what I think is so fascinating about Japanese adaptations. Very, very often I find someone doesn't make one Alice adaptation. They make four, they make five, they make a series, they make things that are sometimes tied together, as in the Hana Toaris, um, but sometimes they make things that are strikingly different. 
there's a screenwriter named Konaka Chiaki, where, and he's very, very successful, um, but out of his, I don't even know, 20 some works last I checked, um, there are something like six that either feature a character named Alice or somehow refer to Wonderland. I think his best known work is probably some, a series called Serial Experiments Lane, which again features a young girl named Alice who is not the protagonist, but it also features in effect an electronic wonderland or a digital wonderland that um, the titular Lane uh, seems to either get lost in or get Alice lost in. Um, so this, this uh, flexibility of Alice, I find, turns into, for some artists, almost a recurring, not, a, not so much a recurring motif, but almost an obsession, um, where they're always going back to it. And you mentioned my work on Kusama. Um, she is one such author. I've written about an, uh, another author named Akutagawa Byunosuke, who did a co-translation of Alice, and then within a year, published a novella called Kappa, that he doesn't call Alice, but it features a young man who is out in the woods one day when he follows a strange animal, falls down the animal's hole into a strange underground world, and sojourns there for a while while learning about their unlogical lives. I feel like it's kind of obviously Alice. Um, so this, this uh, recurrence that I have found is really fascinating to me. The, the way Alice gets into people's minds and then like how I was originally supposed to write one chapter on it, and now I'm writing a book. Alice doesn't seem to leave people alone afterwards. Um, so that it gets that aspect of Alice, its um, repeated utility for artists, um, also kind of ties into something on the next slide, which is that um, anyone can make something that um, anyone can make an Alice adaptation. So you mentioned Alice in the Country of Hearts. The mm -hmm. bottom right image is um, from the screenplay of one of the Alice games. But um, Japan's games industry is very well developed. So they have games that are made by very big companies, but they have games that are also only made by, you know, one maybe person. Um, you know, sometimes though it'll be one person plus a friend. And as a result of that, you have a lot of much smaller games that never get translated and that can almost be forgotten. Um, so the top uh, game image here is from the game Aris to Ai no Maho, Alice and the Magic of Love. And I wanted to contrast this um, because it's very similar in, to Alice in the Country of Hearts in that they both come from the same genre. There's a genre of Japanese games called dating simulations. The player uh, is the, you know, plays the protagonist character, um, but for some reason the protagonist either wants to fall in love with a character or all of the other characters want to fall in love with the protagonist. So the player has to uh, navigate through the game trying to end up in a romantic relationship with the character of their choosing. Um, so in, the, in games, uh, well, since we have two examples of this, in Alice in Wonderland dating simulation games, you'll find that characters like the Mad Hatter um, or the Dormouse become very attractive young men. And so the player uh, is pretending to be Alice, choosing between the attractive young men. I think in the, um, the Land of Hearts one, uh, even the White Rabbit was called Peter, you know, so I was thinking, you know, this has really moved away. <laughs> You know, when um, Alice was romancing about three or four different people, I was thinking, mm -hmm. this is, you know, this is definitely not in the original script. <laughs> um, it is, uh, I think, um, in part, a marker of how flexible Alice can be. And that flexibility in this case means that it's highly adaptable to this pre-existing genre. This is a very popular genre within Japanese video games. Um, you can find also, you know, you can find variations on this where the player is male, you can find variations where the player is female. Um, I think you can find variations where you can choose either male or female and you have a bevy of different potential uh, romantic partners for yourself. 
but um, the game is also the games can also or that genre can provide an entrance for mm, I don't want to say more interesting things, but different things than you would expect. If you ever play Alice in the Country of Hearts, um, I made the mistake of trying to play it quite quickly just to get a sense for the game. I think it took me something like 40 minutes to get beyond the part where you're talking to Alice's sister before she gets into Wonderland. It, you know, it was very much about um, their relationship. It, when they invented, the screenwriters invented text that was not in Carol's books to deepen the relationship between the two sisters. So, you know, obviously they, they were very successful games um, and they wanted to have successful games, but I do feel that creators can sort of, in this case, by merging um, the known property of Alice with the popular genre of dating simulation games, they were able to also add in, you know, a bit of their own. Um, this idea of interest in the uh, sisterly relationship. And just um, so that just to add some balance to this, um, the, the lower left hand game is not quite, uh, it's not in the, the dating simulation game. Not all, Alice, not all Alice games are, although there are quite a few now that are. Um, but the bottom left one is Aris to Fushigi Nakan, or Alice and the um, uh, Alice and Wonder Hall, or Wonder Building, in a sense. This is a very small scale game, comparatively speaking. Um, Alice in the Country of Hearts, they, well, you mentioned how many materials that they have now. There are many, many Alice in the Country of, or many people who have been employed uh, in, the per, in the production of Alice in the Country of Hearts. Alice in Wonder Hall, not so many people were cre uh, hired in the creation of this game. It's a little more focused on uh, puzzle solving, in a sense. Um, so you do get variation in terms of what people are doing, even with uh, the single medium of games. Um, so that's... Mm -hmm. All right, so those were the, the images um, I included from Japan. I thought it might be nice to take a little step further out from Japan. Um, so Japan, as uh, Stephen mentioned earlier, Japan has a history of fantasy um, and supporting fantasy. Not every nation um, has that, that support or not every time period in every nation has that support. If we look at Korea, for example, and uh, India, where I have uh, some images in a bit. Um, there have been, for different reasons, but largely political uh, is what they boil down to, there has been at times a uh, focus on more realist works um, or what are seen as more um, uh, useful works. Um, and so in the, the, the case of Korea and India in particular, you see that we don't have as many translations of Alice as we find in Japan. Um, and you can uh, compare that more directly if you want by looking at the uh, three Alice in a World of Wonderlands volumes, um, which are a phenomenal resource. But even so, um, of late, uh, as Korea, um, part of Korea's uh, difficulty with fantasy came from its, shall we say, complicated political position uh, being colonized by Japan, um, dealing with uh, the division uh, into North and South Korea. Um, and it's they're always had, a, during the 20th century at least, it had a very complicated uh, relationship with authoritarianism and with Marxism. So there was a very strong bent in Korean literature in that period towards Marxist literature, um, which meant you know, some of it meant literature that was directly saying everyone should be Marxist, but some of that meant literature that was very realist and focused on the difficulties of day-to-day -day life. Um, you know, what it was, what it is like to live as a poor person, which is not really what Alice is about. Uh, I, I know I said it was flexible, but that, that one's a bit of a stretch, I think. However, um, of late, Korea has, uh, South Korea has, um, you know, had uh, some economic success. It is 
they're still going through political issues in the way that we all are, um, but they are more secure in a way that they weren't necessarily for much of the 20th century. And so we get materials like Unsuk Chin's Alice in Wonderland opera in 2007. Um, so this was Chin's first ever opera, and she opted to, to create it, uh, or to create a version of Alice in Wonderland for it. Um, and you can kind of see from the um, advertisement here, uh, it was first uh, hosted or uh, put on in Germany, which I think also sort of push, uh, points to the fact that there is an increasing degree of internationalism in Alice adaptations and in media more generally. Um, just as we've been able to talk about Alice in the Country of Hearts because it, many of the books have been translated into English, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the same way, now a Korean woman can create her first opera in Germany about an English story, uh, which I think is utterly fascinating. But at the same time, if you would switch to the next uh, slide. On this one, I've actually, oh, seen yeah. this. I've actually seen this one. And it's a, because um, they put it on in the UK at um, the Barbican. Mm -hmm. And it was a multi, I mean, in terms of opera, it was a multimedia production with cinema, people running around. You know, it was, you know, it was, you know, quite fantastical. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I could have seen it. I'm afraid I only know the secondary materials, but it looks fascinating, doesn't it's, it? It was, you know, incredible. Okay. Um, well, so the um, the next slide is um, Alice Boy from Wonderland by Hu and He, uh, directed uh, in 2015. So this, um, you can kind of, I think, guess from the poster, it's a ghost story. Um, and it uses the uh, images and the symbols of Wonderland, the White Rabbit in particular, to tell this story about the ghost and the ghost's relationship to the woman, uh, the, the Alice character, um, who, she, who is being haunted. And at the same time I say that, it is um, the boy who's considered kind of Alice in a sense. Um, so it's, it's a complicated story where the question becomes, who is Alice? which I find tends to be a recurring theme in these adaptations, um, not in everyone, but um, I showed earlier the manga uh, would, that is uh, literally named, Are You Alice? Mm. This question of who is Alice? Can you be Alice? Can I be Alice? Uh, with the implied yes, we can all be Alice, seems to be an increasing concept with these adaptations. Uh, and so I thought we'd just quickly journey through India, um, which I've been doing some work on um, with uh, the advice of my new colleague, Sujatha Modi. Um, so she pointed me to Rabindranath Tagore. Um, in 1892, Alice in Wonderland had not been translated into any Indian language uh, that we know of. The first one was, I believe, Gujarati in 1917, uh, as far as translations of Alice into Indian languages are concerned. But Rabindranath Tagore had read it. Uh, and in fact, he read it around the time that he wrote the titular story of this collection, The Land of Cards. And the, the um, implications there are quite, or the, the influences, if you read the story, are quite obvious. Um, but I think this is particularly notable, Rabindranath, because Rabindranath Tagore, um, he is uh, the first non uh, sort of Western uh, person to win the Nobel Prize in literature. Um, he is, of course, a huge proponent of, um, you know, the the fictional and non-fictional extent of literature. So in a sense, if anyone was going to support Alice in India, it would have been him and it was him. But in fact, if you look at other people who were involved in the creation and building of the Indian nation uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, like in Korea, but for slightly different reasons, they were very much in favor of useful narratives things that were seen as directly contributing to the creation of a nation and the creation of modern citizens. 
So even though we have this wonderful short story from Tagore in 1892, you don't really, well, like I said, you don't have any translations of Alice for, what is it, 28 years or 25 years. Um, and you don't really see a lot of other Alice materials um, popping up uh, for a while. But as with Korea, if you'll go to the next uh, slide, we do today find a wider variety. Um, so this is Alice in the Wonderland of Dastangoy um, from 2015. Dastangoy is an Indian performance style that I, I, I cannot and will not try to uh, mimic for you, but in, in, it involves a certain type of delivery that's very rhythmic and very engaging and also very kind of um, quick and low, with an upbeat sort of pace. Um, so these two storytellers on screen are in fact in the, they, they've created an Alice in Wonderland uh, Dasangoy and they've performed it and you can find it on YouTube. Um, but you can see that the, the energy and the enthusiasm for Alice has uh, really come to the fore now, um, despite that sort of uh, disinterest in fantasy from a century ago. Um, and so uh, we can stop uh, there if you want, or I can just uh, talk a little bit about that last uh, slide. I'm wondering, um, Mimbe, doesn't India have a tradition of fantasy stories as well? It does have a tradition of uh, fantasy stories in the sense, um, in particular in the sense of some of the, um, I don't want to quite, I think I'm phrasing it a bit awkwardly, but if you think about many of the, the Hindu gods and their stories, there are very strong fantastical elements to those. Um, but at that particular, you know, India as a, a modern nation was created rather oddly um, because it was um, colonized by Britain and uh, ruled by Britain for quite a while. And then when Britain left, um, there, the divisions, um, in particular the division between Pakistan and India, um, that didn't quite um, follow uh, historical divisions between groups of people on the Indian subcontinent. Um, so there was a great deal of concern, shall we say, uh, between prominent people in Indian society about how do we come together as a nation? How do we see ourselves as one people? And so that led to this emphasis uh, within literature on bringing ourselves together, like you're talking about people who don't even speak the same language. Yeah. So how do we create a single culture or a unifying culture? And there, that led to a sort of emphasis on utility at that period. Um, okay, we, that, hmm? yeah. we have a look at some, <clears throat> some of the questions that are in the chat room? Certainly. Okay. find it. I stop share for a while. Yeah. Oh, it's possible to share the slideshow. Um, so did they not translate the chess terms? Yes, you answered that. Um, question about um, Lewis Carroll, I mean, generally the fact that the copyright had uh, expired meant it was fair game to be used by, same in the UK, theatre, film. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the interesting things about that is that I haven't seen any evidence thus far that anyone even cared. You know, nobody, I, I don't think some people knew that it was out of copyright. I don't think people were particularly paying attention to that. Um, so it's this weird kind of non-entity copyright law uh, for Japanese adaptations, at least. Um, so how do people in Japan find the games made by smaller studios or just people who don't have access to the marketing channels used by the large corporations? Marketing channels, no, but um, the the sort of Stores that sell the big games sell the little games too. 
Um, and there is a very strong uh, system of uh, used, let's say used media stores. Um, so there are, for example, there's a huge chain of stores called Book Off, which is mainly used books, but they also sell uh, movies and video games. There are also certain um, neighborhoods. Uh, you may have heard of Akihabara. Um, anything sort of video game or anime related, you can find your merchandise, you can find your costuming uh, materials, like if you need a certain type of wig to play a certain type of character, you can find it in a store in Akihabara. Um, so um, they don't have the, the funds for big advertising campaigns, but they can access distribution channels. And like Alice in the Country of Hearts, once they start gaining some success with distribution, that funds, you know, greater pushes, more advertising. Um, in fact, if I remember correctly, Alice in the Country of Hearts is one of several video games that actually start off selling CDs, which is to say music CDs. Um, well, not, not music exactly, but um, they, they will make sort of audio books that are based in the world that they want to make a video game in. And if that sells and is successful, then they'll make the game sometimes. Okay. Um, have you, has your research taken you into China? So how is it, how is it viewed there? Um, so I haven't gotten um, too much into China yet. Um, there are definitely translations and adaptations in China. I don't know as much about um, video games or, in, or those kinds of materials in China. Um, in part because the way that I have historically come across that, uh, like with the small video games, because they don't advertise them, the way that you find out about them is that you go to the store that sells that kind of thing, and you spend a long time walking around the store just looking and, you know, trying to find something that's Alice, uh, like, I haven't been able to go to China, so I haven't been able to do that kind of on-the-ground research. There was a talk at the Lewis Carroll Society of North America general meeting uh, when it was in San Francisco, which I think was maybe 2015. Um, but uh, one of the speakers uh, talked about uh, Chinese uh, translations, and I believe that that was also uploaded to YouTube, if you're interested in more about that. Okay. Uh, so Sharon Schroeder has got a question about, um, just curious about Alice being popular or unpopular in Asian countries because of their view of fantasy in general. Um, how did it fluctuate over time and whether its reception history is at all different to other types of fantasy? Mm, so what seems to be the case, uh, at least in my research, is that once Alice starts to become popular in its own right, it takes on a life of its own. And that's, uh, again, due to the flexibility for both artists and consumers in, in terms of what Alice, is, what Alice can be used for symbolically, uh, for example. But it's also um, in, uh, see it's in what it's useful, but it's also in terms of just the fact that Alice does it, it seems to get into people's minds, like with the Japanese artists that I mentioned, who don't make one Alice material, they make five. You know, it, you can't seem to leave it alone once or forget about it. Um, in contrast, other types of fantasy, um, there are times that emphasize and de-emphasize uh, that. And I think the easiest example there is to think about the role of different genres outside of uh, Asia. Um, for example, in America, the Western genre was very popular for a while. It's not so popular now. Um, it may be popular again in the future, we'll see. Um, but specific materials within that genre are um, still read by people uh, at times in excess of the genre's popularity. Um, has the Mad Tea Party infiltrated the Japanese tea ceremony? That is a great question. Um, so my guess is that if it has, it's on a more individual basis in the sense that um, individuals attending a, a tea party or a tea ceremony um, might do so while dressed in an Alice kimono 
Um, and there are owls kimono, I've seen them. I almost bought one, but I, I had no money left to spend. Um, but um, you can also get owl sweets, and there are sweets that are part of the uh, traditional uh, Japanese tea ceremony. So my guess is that if there is connection, um, it's coming there. Um, I have no, no evidence that it has happened, but I, I feel like given the materials that are available, at some point, someone who was, in, was interested uh, must have done some sort of crossover um, event. The time. <laughs> um, someone pointed out, I think, as we were discussing um, the Surrealist film by Jan Svankmeyer. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, it's a little bit like one of the pictures that you, that you put up. Mm -hmm. The Yamigari Alice, Alice mm -hmm. yes. It might be good uh, at the end of it. I mean, I'll I'll send out the the slides to everyone mm -hmm. if that's okay. Um, and if you can provide some of the names as well for people who want to investigate a bit more. Yeah, sure. Um, Sharon Schroeder. Yeah, um, the Alice reception in the West has been separate because of its language play, um, so it's different to normal fantasy. What do you think about it? Yeah, um, Alice definitely, once it starts getting um, established, it, it does seem to have its own life separate from fantasy as a genre. It's um, more on the, the early end. And um, maybe the best example to think of is the, uh, langu the, the, the sort of dual translations that I talked about, uh, where you have the English and the Japanese in the same book so that people can learn English. If you are, uh, if you are um, like this uh, gentleman called Duvedi from India, um, he was very much focused on useful materials. So if he were going to be putting out a English language learning book at that time, because of his focus on useful materials as opposed to fantasy, which personally I would still argue is useful, but um, he would probably not choose Alice when he could choose uh, middle March, for example. On the other hand, if you're not, if you don't have that uh, sort of bias against things that are fantastical, uh, then why wouldn't you, right? Um, and once Alice gets established in its own right, then it becomes a known quantity. Uh, it becomes uh, less a matter of um, well, it becomes like we know it now as a classic in its own right. Mm. And then you don't identify it so much with one genre or your biases against certain types of material. Okay. A um, couple more questions. So do you know in which period the Japanese translation becomes more consistent with the original material? Has the change been gradual or sudden? And is there any other reason why Alice was so successful in Japan unlike other children's stories. Mm -hmm. Right, um, so as far as the translation content becoming more regular, that happened, I would say, somewhat steadily, but also somewhat quickly. Because so much Western material was coming into Japan in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the, um, let's say, the learning curve was very quick, or the, you know, within, um, let's see, 1899, within a decade, I would say, um, readers understood the concept of um, the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. They understood what a, a Mad Hatter was. They might not know why the Hatter was mad, you know, the, the background of um, the materials involved in making hats, driving people, or be making people ill. Um, but they, they understood a higher degree or a higher percentage of the basic references within Alice. And in line with that, I think the first time we see Alice referred to as Aris, which is just the, uh, the word, the name Alice with a Japanese accent. I want to say that was 1907. Um, I could be off on that, but um, certainly by the 1920s, everyone is calling her Aris. It's um, a, a known thing today to the point that there is a mystery author whose pen name is Arisugawa Aris or Alice Alice River. Which is totally was, not a normal was, Japanese uh, name. I was going to say in the West, it was certainly in the UK, there was almost a reverse discovery of Chinese culture. So I'm just mm -hmm. thinking that how quickly the Mikado, for example, 
by Gilbert and Sullivan was made as well for a while. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Van Gogh did Japanese style paintings. There was a rediscovery of Japanese culture in, mm -hmm. um, in the West, almost a, a reverse Alice phenomenon. Mm -hmm. That time period is really fascinating artistically. You see the, the Japanese uh, style, um, and particularly in uh, painting and its relationship to Impressionism uh, in uh, Britain and France in particular. Uh, even as you see Japan suddenly importing, you know, Tom Sawyer and Alice in Wonderland. So it's a very vibrant period. Yeah. Um, so is there, a, is there a correlation between the popularity of Alice in a certain country and the strength of their ties to, to England it's from Dana? Not that I've found, no. Okay. And I think we, we, I forgot to answer the second question on that one about is there any reason why Alice is so successful unlike other children's stories? Um, there are other uh, children's stories that have been quite successful in Japan. I think part of the reason that Alice's continuing, uh, part of the reason for Alice's continuing success is that it is so flexible and has so many um, distinct visuals. A lot of the materials that I work from, I see time and again, they're using the card suits, you know, the hearts and the clove, uh, clovers, uh, the hearts and the clubs and uh, those uh, four, but they're also using images like teacups, um, the Mad Hatter's hat, that visuality makes it very flexible for anyone working in contemporary media that is anything other than basically a podcast. Um, even audiobooks. I mentioned that um, many of these uh, video games, the smaller ones, they start off with uh, voice actors playing different characters in the game that someone hopes to make. Um, even those come with images right on the cover. And actually, I think they have one here. Don't know if you can see this very well. Um, but he's got, where's my finger? Um, he's got, no, that's not at all visible. I'm sorry, but he has a pocket watch. Um, and uh, a, a white rabbit is right on the cover there. So those kinds of images enable people to automatically tie in works to Alice in a way that um, you don't see as much with something like Heidi. Yeah, or um, you know, things like, the, I'm trying to think of other things that were around at the same time, like the Water Babies as well, mm. would have not have been, um, it's a clearer, as you say, it's a clearer visual with playing mm. cards, which I suppose did exist in Japan in those, in that period as well. They were, I think, imported around, well, they may have been, they were commonly played. Japan had its own version of that type of game, um, but I feel like they must have been known because sailors would have brought them. Um, but they, they weren't a common thing, I would say, before then. And someone has just um, remembered that, um, Tim Burton used the kimono in the Looking Glass film. Mm. Yes, he's, he's situating Alice as a, um, a traitor, right? As a, as a traveler, yes, exactly. Um, so yeah. it's, it's a perfect tie in there. And let me um, see if I'll, I can just see if I can... Um, okay. I'll try and... unmute everyone so that we can suddenly so realize that it's here. Unmute. I'm just trying to see where the uh, the unmute piece is. B, if you can unmute yourself. Oh, there you go. Because if any people have got any other questions, then they can um, fire them away. Amanda, very nice to see you again. 
and um, it was great. I remember your talk very well in London. I'm just wondering when we're going to see your book. Any idea? I'm afraid not yet. <laughs> um, the proposal for it went under submission at a journal or at an um, academic publisher uh, just a few months before the pandemic struck. Um, so I'm not actually sure. I, I called their office once just to see how things were progressing and they, did, they didn't even have anyone answering the phone at the time. <laughs> Um, so I can say the manuscript is progressing while I wait to hear back from them. Um, so hopefully the, the end result won't be any particular delay. Um, but it's, uh, I have a, a draft of pretty much everything in uh, some degree of completion, shall we say. Great. There's always revising. Let us know. I will, thank you. I want to mention it in Bandersnatch, I'm sure. And thank you for your time. I mean, are there any other questions from anybody on the call?